thousands of people all over Europe, and especially in France during World War II, who were waiting for a secret message from BBC. The word had been spread around by the French underground for quite a period of time, and it would come in a coded message of all sorts of words which didn't really mean anything, just random paragraphs taken out of a book or some piece of poetry or something else, and they would listen sitting there with their ears glued to a clandestine radio because they were not allowed to have radios. The Germans took them all away because they knew they would be listening to BBC and maybe underground kind of broadcast that they didn't want them to hear because of propaganda purposes. Well, because they had been under the brutal occupation of Nazi Germany for so many years, these people were just desperate for liberty, for freedom, and for the invasion to take place. They were waiting for an invasion. They knew it was inevitable. They knew it was going to come. They knew from other sources, because we did drop by parachute at night and sometimes land in a clandestine field using the STOL Lysander, the British had, operatives, both male and female, inside occupied France during World War II. On one night, I forget exactly what the messages were, but BBC came on with a French broadcast and they said, Le Cheval est Blanc. Or they would say, j'entre dans la salle de classe. Or they would say, je regarde sur le monde la photographie de la Tour Eiffel. Uh, or something like that. I see the photograph of the Eiffel Tower. Or I enter into the classroom. Or the horse is white. And it was just a lot of disjointed things. And all of a sudden, that one word that the French underground had spread was broadcast to all these people. Well, then they immediately went out and did all that they could to spread the word, and they did more than that. The French underground, of course, immediately started to blow up radio towers and railway bridges and roadways, railways and intersections and Nazi troop columns or whatever they could do. Now, the reason I'm drawing this analogy is because there is a great fascination today in all of our country, at least, if not all of the Western English-speaking world, with life in outer space. Question, do you believe there is life in outer space? I do. I believe God is in heaven, and I believe God is in outer space. And the Bible talks about the third heaven. It talks about a heaven where the birds fly, and then the heavens where the stars and the galaxies are, and then it talks about the third heaven, as the Apostle Paul did, when he had an out-of-the-body experience, one caught up to the third heaven who heard words that man is not supposed to hear, and so on. So we know that somewhere, maybe beyond one of the far galaxies, but galaxies go on forever. Your mind, my mind, just boggle. They just balk at that moment. The idea that the universe extends equidistant away from you in all directions forever just boggles your mind. Now, if you think that's a theological statement, you're crazy as a loon. That is not a theological statement. That is a statement that is factual astronomy. It simply happens to be the truth. Your mind and mine are governed by limits, and those limits imposed upon our mind also limit even our imagination to some extent. Because you cannot imagine something. I can't either that goes on forever and ever and ever and ever because everything has to have a starting place and an ending place, a beginning and an end. Now, believe it or not, when I pick up my Bible, I'm holding something in my hand that is a message from outer space. This is not an earthly book. It is a heavenly book. It was dictated. It was inspired. It was given both orally and through inspiration from life, life beings, beings that were alive from outer space. Jacob's ladder is a case in point where Jacob was given a lesson that a lot of us could well take heed to and listen to because when he lay down his head on that stone, padding it very thoroughly, no doubt with blankets and cushions and so on, he was given a vision of the angels of God ascending and descending up to heaven, which showed him direct and an instant immediate communication between earthlings and heavenly beings. I don't know how much into space and space exploration most of you are, but some of the NASA photographs that have been coming through recently from the Hubble Space Telescope are absolutely mind-boggling. 
There was one full color picture and I was able to get it off of AOL and go to the Hubble Space Telescope, NASA's webpage, take a look at it. It looked like just dozens of stars, a picture that the Hubble Space Telescope had taken way out the other side of our galaxy. And those little pinpricks of light, every one of them was a galaxy the size of our Milky Way with perhaps 200 billion stars being seen only as one little light far out there billions of light years away. It just is awesome. Now you've seen the little roller skate bump up against the rock on the surface of Mars and tip over and then the camera went blank, we didn't see anything else. You've known about the penetration of the Venusian atmosphere, which is a poisonous atmosphere of gases and cloud. You've known about soft landings on Io, one of the moons of Jupiter. You know about all the various rings of Saturn, I think, and you know that they've discovered other moons that they didn't even know that the planets had. And even though I preached it because I knew it from the Word of God, knew it from the plan of God, clear back when I was in my late 20s in the 1950s, I knew that since our orange dwarf star holds in its velvety gravitational field all of our planetary bodies, that every one of those other stars also holds in its gravitational field any number of planets. And since there are so many trillions of billions of stars, one asks the question, what does God want to do with the entire human race anyway? What does God want to do with five or six or more billion human beings? And you look at the plan of God of how absolutely great and awesome it is. It has a beginning and it has an end. It is a plan that was revealed from outer space. It reveals with you being brought on the scene as a being from outer space penetrates what in effect is like the Venusian atmosphere of Earth. As he came closer to it and beheld it, he could see nothing but brilliant white because the sun rays were reflected off of a mantle of cloud that was so thick and so impenetrable that not one little ray of sun could begin to penetrate the earth. There's never been cloud cover like that since. Not in the middle of the day. Not cloud cover so thick you can't even see anything. Not cloud cover so thick that it's like they turn the lights out in the bottom of the Carlsbad Caverns. But if you will turn to Genesis 1 and verse 1, it says, In the beginning, God, and the word God is, all of you know, I think, many of you know, Elohim. And Elohim is a plural word. The I am on the end of it means more than one. That's why he said later on in verse 26, let us make man in our image. I've told you before, the English word God comes from the old Anglo-Saxon word gu, G-H-E-U. And it merely meant to pour, as in either a libation to a pagan god or to pour, as in pouring molten metal into a mold. Our language is utterly pagan. We have borrowed many of our words from High German and Low German, from Dutch, from French, from Latin, from Greek, and it is a conglomeration of the Germanic tongues gradually metamorphosed, gradually evolved into the Old English language. And now today our modern English language has come down to us and it's rapidly changing as well. For, for instance, they're dropping all the adverbs. You and I could help if you would please next time when the waiter comes up to you in the restaurant and he says, are you done? Why don't you say, well, I haven't really been put on yet, uh, but I am finished if that's what you're asking. You could help me to rescue adverbs and keep them in the English language. But nevertheless, our language is completely pagan. I'm not suggesting that we do not any longer say the word God. I'm just telling you that even the word God, in our English language, when I take my tongue and flatten it out and say God like that, and the way I form it with the tongue and the, and the mouth and the, as they call it, the, the glottis and so on, is a pagan sound. God, and I think of the Creator, and I think of Jesus Christ as the Creator, the member of Divine Elohim who did the creating, but I don't think of a divinized father figure stretching out his finger toward Adam as the painting on the Sistine Chapel in Rome tries to depict. I don't think of a grandfather figure with a white beard sitting in a big throne looking at all of his subjects. I think instead of the creator of all of his acts and of his deeds, and I cannot put a face to God. 
I can only think of stars brighter than our sun that if I were to look, it would blind me and I would never be able to see his face. And in that brilliance and that brightness, sitting right next to him, and again, I can't quite see the facial fixture, uh, features, rather, but I can see that there is a person, quote, who looks like the Son of Man, who is seated at the right hand of this brilliant throne of God the Father. I do not know how long, how pointed, how broad was Jesus' nose. I do not know how thick were his lips or how wide was his mouth. I don't know whether he had a jutting chin or a normal chin or a receding chin. I just know the Bible tells me he looked like any ordinary Jewish young man of his day, and that he has no form nor comeliness that when we see him, we would desire him. Now, let's put it this way. Once upon a time, there was a visitor from outer space. I know I won't lose you now because some of you may be Trekkies. I can't believe that, don't tell me if you are, but uh, there are people who are absolute devotees and fanatics for Hollywood concoctions of Star Wars and stellar travel and outer space and on and on. And I sometimes think that Satan the devil is preparing the mind of man to fight Christ at his second coming because they're going to assume it's an invasion of other beings like ETs from some other planet instead of understand it's the second coming of Christ. That's just what I opine. Well, once upon a time, this being from outer space came closer and closer and closer to this earth, which was just a beautiful, brilliant white as it reflected almost a Venusian-like atmosphere of thick clouds. In the beginning, Elohim created the heaven and the earth. That's in the beginning. There was a moment when there was nothing, and your mind cannot conceive of that. And then there was a moment when there was creation. Now, what is creation? Well, you have to ask, what is matter? What is matter? I didn't have the time, and I probably wouldn't have known how many little rocks to get, but I was going to go out in the backyard where I have a lot of little rocks that are from uh, creek beds, and they're composed of orthoclase and plagioclase, feldspar, and various pieces of granite that might have things like quartz and pitch blend or horn blend or something else in it, mica, of course and different and nice, which is G-N-E-I-S-S, which is a kind of a gray granite. Bedrock is what? Granite. The granitic upthrusts in the mountains, like out at Mount McKinley and uh, down at, uh, in, in Southern California, Mount Whitney, that's bedrock thrust up through isoclines and geosynclines when the mountains would just grind together and just thrust up the bedrock. Then on the shelves and sometimes on the sides of that bedrock, you have a volcanic cinder cone. You can read that like a book, can't you? Which came first, the upthrust or the volcano? Obviously, the volcano came second, didn't it? So if the volcano and magmatic intrusions have flowed just like a river all over a huge valley and have eroded and been cut, and you can see it there, and you can know that that is all kinds of flint and pumice and ash, and it's volcanic in origin. If it has been mixed and then driven by a river and interspersed with other kind of rocks, you can read that because the bulk of the rocks of the earth are, of course, water-borne and water-carried. I was going to bring those little rocks, and I was going to let you hold those little rocks in your hand, every one of you, and I was going to say, which one is older, the little rock in your hand or the Bible on your lap? Well, obviously, you're going to say the rock. And you know how old that rock is? It's as old as this verse we're reading, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. That little rock was here before Jesus walked the earth. That little rock, the one out here in a flower bed, the ones underneath this building, you don't have to go to the Middle East to find an old rock. Rocks in Texas are just as old as those in the Middle East. And they date all the way back way before Christopher Columbus and way before the Great Pyramids and way before the creation of Adam. Now, of course, evolutionists think that when some hominid first quit dragging his knuckles along the ground and stood upright that that's the beginning of man, but I've dealt with that over decades and I don't want to deviate into that now. It says the earth was without form and void, meaning it was without any particular shape and it was empty. Now, if you will hold that thought and hold that place for a moment, let me tell you what that word is. It says, and this is in Bullinger's Companion Bible and any of the exhaustive concordances, if you look up the words form and void, you will find that it is tohu and bohu. Kind of strange sounding Hebrew words, aren't they? Tohu 
and Bohu, form and void. Then if you will turn to Isaiah 45, 18. For thus says the Eternal that created the heavens, God Himself that formed the earth and made it, He has established it, He created it not Tohu, He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Eternal, and there is none else. So He did not create it Tohu, but it says, And the earth was without form and void, the, word, the earth was Tohu, but it wasn't created Tohu. Well, then you look up the word was, and sure enough, it can mean and should be rendered, in this case, became. Because you were looking at an earlier creation in the first verse, and a second recreation in the second verse, and the lapse of time between those two verses, so to speak, that are telling you about these great events, could have been up to four and one half, or even six billion years. Now, I was talking about this just the other day to someone. We had in our hands a huge fossil that was the shoulder of a gigantic ammonite. And it had been around for who knows how long. And I just said, this fossil is either from the date of the time of the earth being covered with water after its destruction, or it is at the time of the Noatian deluge. Only two choices. It is very, very ancient. It is long before the time of Jesus Christ. So when you hold a fossil in your hands, or if you go out to Painted Desert, or if you go out to the Petrified Forest, as they call it in Arizona, and there are places out there where whole huge trees, the trunks are intact. I have bookends made of pieces of petrified wood that are just like rosy hues of gorgeous colors. And what is that? Well, those are the chemicals, the minerals that were actually in solution that gradually replaced the wood as it slowly rotted. It became super saturated, and gradually as these chemicals hardened, the wood is no more. And what you see are these beautiful, beautiful uh, minerals that are there that give you every kind of a hue you can imagine. And it's very, very ancient. The earth became tohu and void and empty. How did it become void and empty? Now what do you see when you look at immediate near space? Do you see life? No. They're insisting it's out there. They know it's out there somewhere, and they're right, but they're looking for creatures with long stem-like necks and eyes about this big around. They're looking for little guys like they claim walked around in Roswell, New Mexico. They want desperately to prove evolution. Now, there's a guy up there that goes up to pay his own way so that he can try to find out whether certain spermatozoon or spermatozoa or certain seeds will germinate in, in space or in weightlessness. What is that all about? What are the hundreds of billions and the trillions of dollars that have been spent on the scientific aspect, forgetting the military aspect for the moment, of NASA and of space exploration. Nothing short of trying to prove evolution and disprove God and disprove the Bible. If they can discover, if they think, some being somewhere, some radio wave, some communication, and actually communicate, oh, there are a lot of people say they already have. But you don't want to talk to them very long without, you know, being safe and protected, make sure that the guys from the nuthatch are somewhere close by because you could get in trouble. Like the two guys that made up the lie that were sitting on a fishing dock down in Pascagoula, Mississippi one time and claimed that this thing had landed and they'd been caught up into it and then they'd been let go and they told this big story. And they both had got their stories pretty straight so they stuck to it for quite a period of time. There are a lot of people who really do believe that on a regular basis this earth is being visited by other extraterrestrial beings, aren't there? So the Hollywood propaganda has done its work. They believe that. I believe that too, except I believe you can't see them. And I believe they are angelic spirits that can actually watch over you and me and our children and grandchildren. And I believe that there are perverted, twisted, evil, rotten, filthy, demonic spirits doing Satan's work that will try to affect you, that will try to put thoughts in your mind, that will try to actually even in some cases materially intervene in the sense of people that have been so beleaguered that they've had drawers opening and pajamas coming out and floating across the room and then closing again. I wouldn't ever want something like that to happen to me. 
But what Hollywood is trying to get people to think is that there are beings like we are, but their eyes are always either one big eye or huge eyes, a little V-shaped head or like a, a little like E.T. You know, he's got a, a neck like a, a microphone and a little flat head like been run over in the street and that type of thing. And Hollywood makes them about as grotesque as they possibly can and people buy into that. Once upon a time, the earth was totally empty, void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. So the earth, all the tectonic plates and the continents were covered with water. The Spirit of God moved, or it says brooded over, contemplated, brooded over, the face of the deep, or the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. That is not a statement that God suddenly created the sun. The sun was by now, who knows, six billion, six trillion, sixty million? Quadrillion, trillion, take your pick, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter from the standpoint of the earth. There was an earlier creation. It was a beautiful creation. It was a perfect creation. He made it perfectly. He formed it to be established. He did not create it in, bo in Bohu or Tohu Bohu. He formed it to be inhabited, Isaiah 45, 18. What happened in between? Now, I don't want to divert to go all the way through every bit of that, but you'll find the answer to that in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. There was a great powerful being who was one of the three archangels mentioned in the Bible, Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer. And I'll just go to Ezekiel 28 right quickly, just for a part of this. I don't want to take time to go through all of it, or I would end up with no time to finish what I have in mind here. But it says that this is a type, of course, of the prince of Cyrus, uh, uh, the king of Tyre, I should say, the king of Tyrus. And right in the middle of a verse, it begins to change in verse 12 to show you where it is the type and the antitype. Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. The prince of Tyre was never in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardonyx or sardius, the topaz, the diamond. What is diamond? It is pure graphite. You know how to get graphite? Take white sugar, put it in a pan, heat it until it smokes, and when it smokes, it will completely be cooked and it'll turn black. Take your finger and look, and it is just black dust. That's pure graphite at that point. Now, diamonds are made of that, but they're made in, under such great heat that they're in the very heart of a volcano. Have you ever seen diagrammed in your chemical class or your class about physics or astronomy or anything else in high school, have you ever seen the, the actual chemical formulae for some of the stones? Uh, you may not have gone to that type of class, but nevertheless, if you haven't, do you know that, for example, in the chemi chemical formula, when you're writing out all the various symbols for the various chemical elements that are found in quartz, that you will see H2O? Isn't that amazing? H2O, hydrogen to two of oxygen, water is one of the chemical elements in quartz. Now all this is telling you, these are earthly elements here, earthly stones that have been formed. Some of them by water, some of them by oil leaching into this, such as topaz, I should say the uh, the little stone from Australia that I can't come up with a name for it right now. The beryl, the onyx, the jasper, sapphire, emerald, the carbuncle, and gold, workmanship of your pipes and tabrets and pipes, uh, was prepared in thee from the day that you were created. That I'm not certain, and I don't think anyone else is really, it says settings and sockets in the Jewish version. And I think it really has to do with simply his physiognomy in a spiritual sense, the way he was put together the way he was formed. Remember that there was not a serpent that appeared to Eve, it was a nakash. And a nakash merely means a whispering and chanting being, a whispering and chanter. He could have been a huge creature looking just like a dragon, with every kind of beautiful color, with wings, standing upright, and speaking suddenly to Eve. Eve wouldn't have been amazed. She wouldn't have been amazed if it had been a hippopotamus or a rhinoceros. Would have said, hey, lady, what's, what's for dinner today? She wouldn't have cared. She had no prior experience. There was no reason to be afraid. She did not know the, the meaning of the word fear. So in this creature that could have been an absolute incredible creature, it may have even looked like an eagle, a man, a lion, and an ox. It may have stood there like a gigantic bull of Bashan with its 
head with like a man toward her, and she would have looked at this creature with a head out that way and one out that way and one back here and big wings and hooves and a tail like a lion. You remember the Sphinx guarding the pyramid in Egypt, don't you? You've seen the pictures on the walls of Beers Nimrud and some of the Babylonian gates. You've seen the Semiramis Gate of Babylon and pictures of it and woodcuts and pictures in old Bible books that show the winged bulls of Bashan. Well, this is nothing more than a characterization of ancient artists who were depicting as faithful as they could what they saw. Because after Adam and Eve were expelled from the Garden of Eden, it said that God put cherubim there with swords turning each way to prevent any from mankind to ever get back into Eden again. So as the centuries went by, and remember one-sixth of all Earth's history transpired from the time of Eden until the flood of Noah's time, as the centuries went by, 600 years and more, a thousand years finally, there were lots of people. Wayfarers would assay to go toward the Garden of Eden. And some huge creature would come boiling out of there, maybe with a frothy kind of a growl of some kind. Where do you think all the mythology of a creature that looks like a dragon, serpentine, with big wings and an evil looking face with a tongue spewing out fire, guarding all the goodies, guarding all the treasures of the world, the castle at the end of the crag, why do you think the old tradition of St. George and the dragon has been perpetuated down all this time? Or Jack and the beanstalk. Fee, fi, fo, fum, I smell the blood of an Englishman. You know, the gold and the goose that laid the golden egg and all the jewels are up there. And this one little guy essays to go get it. Well, all of that kind of tradition is actually rooted in actual fact. And I believe that the children of Noah wrote of their experiences, and it's fascinating that when God Almighty tells Moses how to construct the tabernacle in the wilderness, he gives him every little detail, even about pomegranates, and how to do it, and how the tapestry should be, and how all the decorations should be, and then he says, you shall adorn it with cherubim, and there's not one word to tell Moses what a cherub looked like. Not until Ezekiel, the first chapters, or any word in the Bible about what a cherub looks like. And yet Moses was told to decorate the ark with cherubim because he would have known. The tradition had been handed down. And Ezekiel, the first chapter, tells you exactly what a cherub looks like and that there were seraphim and cherubim and that they were over God's throne and around God's throne and they are created beings, of great archangels of different sizes and shapes. Seraphim have six wings, it says in Isaiah 6, and cherubim have four. And there are also 24 elders around the throne of God. Now, I doubt very much that the average person, when he or she gets on her knees to pray, imagines in your mind's eye a huge translucent sea of glass like a brilliant piece of onyx or maybe pure quartz that is hundreds of yards long. And behind it, a giant rainbow. And as far as you can see in every direction, millions of angels and seated on both sides of a throne, which is so brilliant you can't really see it, but like a brilliant shining sun, are 24 ancient elders. And there is a person looking like a human being, but in glorified form, all in white, you can't quite make out his face either, that is seated to your left or on the right-hand side of God the Father. And that the Bible describes in the book of Revelation the throne of God. Did the throne of God ever come down to this earth? Was there ever a visit from outer space? The point is, many times. Many, many times. And it's going to happen again. Now let's deal with some of these times. Here in the 28th chapter of Ezekiel, it says, in the latter part of verse 13, the workmanship of your settings and sockets was prepared in you in the day that you were created. So he's a created being. You are the anointed cherub that covereth. When they made the little cherubim, they made replicas, perhaps of oxen, with their wings stretched. They always show in tradition men. All the pictures that you will see in the Bible books will show looking like two men with wings that are almost touching that are standing there over the mercy seat. I'm not so sure that's what it looked like. 
We'll find out eventually when God unearths the Ark of the Covenant, wherever it is, and shows it to the world once again because it was a sacred icon or object, and I'm sure that he has not had it destroyed. But they were like as if to represent the sheltering, covering cherubim right over the throne of God. You are the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. You are upon the holy mountain of God. You have walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Now, stones of fire merely meant brilliant jewels that gave off, you know, all of the primary colors like a diamond does. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created till iniquity, and iniquity means lawlessness or sin, was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, now I've explained that before, but for those of you that haven't looked it up, it means by the incredible multitude of your trafficking, of your going about as a trafficker. Now here was an individual who became like so many human beings are. You ever, you've heard of Narcissus. Have you ever had to deal with a person who was narcissistic? I have, in the Navy, and I won't go into some other examples that I could bring. But there are people who are so, Narcissus, remember, according to the old Greek fable, was he saw this pool and he looked at his reflection and he was just so beautiful that he couldn't take his eyes off himself. And he just sat there and stared and looked at himself and adored himself. Now the Bible says no man has ever yet hated his own flesh. That's certainly true, except in the case of some people that I think demonic uh, want to commit suicide. But an awful lot of people so love themselves that they adore themselves, I can tell you that. What was the one my father used to quote about, I, I adore myself, I put my arms around myself and give myself a squeeze and I can't believe how wonderful I am and so on, look at me, I can do anything better than you can do, and on and on and on. And you've seen that, egocentricity, absolute uh, people who are, are so narcissistic and so self-centered, so selfish, that everything has got to be incoming. They have no time for anybody else but themselves. I don't know if you go by a reflective window and a lot of times some of the restaurants, a lot of fun to sit right in the window of a restaurant if it's one of these two-way deals where they can't see in and you can see out and you watch people go by that do everything from tugging their girdles to fixing their hair. It's the funniest thing you ever saw. You're sitting there eating dinner and people are going by looking at you. They can't see that you're even in there, but they see their reflection or checking how they're walking, you know. And, and going by. So I don't know how much time people spend looking in a mirror, but all of us have to spend a fair amount of our time looking in a mirror. And very few people say, ghastly, that's an ugly face. You know, very, very few people do. All right. He began to become jealous of God, resentful of God, thinking, why am I down here on this one little planet when God has all of this he was so infatuated with his own beauty that it began to grow like a root, uh, like a cancerous root in his mind, and he went about trafficking. It says, by the multitude of your merchandise, they have filled the midst of you with violence. Terrible translation. By the multitude of your tra trafficking, you have been filled with violence. Look at the Bullinger's Companion Bible and the, some of the other Bible helps on that re with that regard, and you'll find out. And you have sinned, therefore I will cast you as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stone of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You have corrupted your wisdom by reason of your brightness, and that's the end of the antitype, and it fades back to Tyre. I will cast, lay you before kings that they may behold you. Now, when he essayed to overthrow God, I've, I've got to go to the 14th chapter of Isaiah to complete this thought. I don't want to leave you hanging with it because that's a very important one. And that's exactly when the original Star Wars took place. It would be absolutely wonderful if Hollywood would make a movie sometime and stick to the script. It would be absolutely wonderful if they would do a movie about creation about the real Garden of Eden, for example, or about anything that I'm talking about, the real, the, the recreation or the pre-creation, the real original creation. 14th chapter and beginning in verse 12 of the book of Isaiah, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Let me pause to say that Jesus Christ said very clearly, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. 
One of his many statements which indicate his pre-existent state that he was with God, he was God, as it says in John the first chapter, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. So Jesus Christ testifies this is true. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Now Lucifer is not an evil name. You know, they used to call matches Lucifers because of that stupid concept that Lucifer has something to do with fire or with hell, the burning fires of hell. So when the matches first were invented and came out where he had that little sulfuric white tip to strike the match and we still have them to this day, they used to call them in the American West Lucifers. Have you got any Lucifers with you? Well, they don't do that anymore. They just call them matches. Lucifer means a bright, shining star of the dawn, day star. It means light bringer. It is actually a very beautiful name with a beautiful connotation. It's perverted because of who he became. O Lucifer, son of the morning, how are you cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. Now, isn't that exactly what Satan, the devil, has got all of Christendom, all of Islam, and all of every other religion in the world saying to itself? I will ascend into heaven. I'll get, I'll meet you in heaven. When the saints go marching in, I'm going to heaven. No, you're not. No, you're not. God's coming down here. Now, we'll be in heaven when heaven is here because God is coming down here. Because God wants to be with His creation, with His creatures, with His family. And He's coming home to be with His family. We're not going to go up there like so many pieces of popcorn, like some kind of a soul factory, and every single day thousands of people die and go flitting off up to there or go to the heart of the earth wherever they think hell is. This idiotic Protestant ideas that they have gotten clear back from the third century and haven't altered from that time. A time when they thought that when you'd see maggots in meat that it was spontaneous generation for pity's sake. And when they would bleed people thinking that would heal them of their diseases. Well, the last thing in the world they should have done. Why in the world we modern people would think that people in the third century should know more about theology than we do when we've got an awful lot more of the real wealth of information than even some of them had at their fingertips, I don't know. But to this day, the major churches still stick to the creeds that were fashioned and were made, you know, just stamped in concrete and made as dogma way back at the Council of Nicaea in the third century. And they've never changed it since. So, he said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. The angels of God is implied as well as the stars of God. Take that either way you wish. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. No one ever really has figured that out. It's exactly why it seems that this earth has both a magnetic and true north. And why it was moved out of its true a place to create the wobble that has been put into this earth so that we'd have the seasonal variation that we do, or why it is that we think north is up and the south is down. But it may be that north points in a direction that is significant and that south does not. Now beyond that, we don't know. But he talks about the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Oh, well then he was below the heights of the clouds. Yeah, he was on the earth. He was a creature that was put on this earth. Now, I don't know how much you know about the age of the dinosaurs. I don't know how much you know about the Permian period of time, as they call it. Although, remember that there is no such thing as a geologic succession of strata. There are areas where there are 50 billion or 60 million or 100 million missing, where you can have tertiary out of the ice ages resting conformably upon the Devonian, and everything from that time, the age of fishes, is missing, which is hundreds and hundreds of millions of years. So you can find out about that in the books such as I have mentioned before that are written by many people who absolutely just trash and destroy the theory of evolution. But the point is that here, he says, he would ascend above the heights of the clouds, and clouds form in the earth's atmosphere. He was on this earth below the clouds. I will be like the Most High, yet thou shalt be brought down to Hades, to the sides of the pit. It fades back into the antitype again, which is now the king of Babylon. So Lucifer, and he is named here, 
an archangel, deliberately tried to overthrow God. Now Jesus said, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven, and he may have been there to give the command. What do you suppose happened when Lucifer tried to mount up with who knows how many hundreds of millions of angels? I don't know how many there are on the earth, but there are more than just 10 or 20. There may be countless millions. And by his merchandising or his trafficking or his constant talk, 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 talk. You know, I've known people that when they're going to do an evil deed and they're about to do something and they're going to put across a deal, they're going to do something which is really evil, they've got to justify it to themselves and they've got to justify it to others. So they prepare the ground. They float trial balloons. They start talking about it. And they talk about every aspect of it. And they reason about why it's not as bad as it might seem to you at first. And I've seen those tactics used in churches and among and between individuals for a lot of my life. So I've seen people who do that kind of thing. And there are people who are very influential, who are good talkers. As God's Word says in the book of Proverbs, He talketh with His feet. There are some people even when they stand around and talk, they're moving around, they're kind of tapping their feet and doing different things. And, They've got the body language to go with the real language when they're trying to talk to you. And they can be very persuasive. They can be magnetic, the way Satan the devil was very persuasive with Eve. And eventually people just listen to them and they give in to their line of malarkey and they become convinced and sometimes even against their will. I don't know whether it took a hundred million years or four billion years, because there's plenty of time to work with between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. Creation, and then destruction, and then recreation. Now between creation and destruction, there was a gorgeous earth down here. And guess what was here? Billions of creatures. Dinosaurs, gigantic sea monsters, a pterodactyl that would take off in flight, with a wingspan of a 747, and the bones have been found. Creatures like you cannot believe. A saber-toothed tiger would have been an awesome creature, tooth about that long. Can you imagine elephants that are twice to three times as big as the ones we have? Can you imagine giant rhinoceros that were two times bigger and larger than we have, longer-legged, but their bones have been found? Have you ever been to one of the natural museums in the world? Have you ever been to the one out at USC campus, or the one in, the cam up in, in uh, Chicago, which is one of the greatest of all? I have walked underneath Tyrannosaurus rex. I have walked underneath the Brontosaurus. Every bone of it there, gigantic creature. Did they really exist, folks? Sure they did. Did they die suddenly? They're still arguing today about why the dinosaurs were buried and died suddenly. Now there's a place out in West Texas, out past, uh, you go out toward Odessa, Midland Odessa, it's called the Permian Basin. You aware of that? You know what that is? They named that after the stratum in which all of these creatures were buried because it is an oil field and because it is a tremendous oil production area. And they discovered in that soil the buried bodies, which is what oil is, of all of these creatures. You ever heard of the La Brea Tar Pits in Los Angeles? There are some tar pits there where these creatures would come anciently and get entrapped and they had been bogged down and the tar had preserved the bones and there's a museum there and there are saber-toothed tigers and every kind of creature you wouldn't have thought been roaming around Los Angeles, but they were there on the North American continent. There were dinosaurs. I go hunting every year, God willing, in an area right north of Dinosaur National Monument where there are thousands of dinosaur bones, and I've seen them, some of them, I mean, the bones are as big around as I am. Unbelievable creatures. So you see this creation. Now it makes me wonder, did God allow Lucifer to have a part in the design of these creatures? There was an awful lot of violence, an awful lot of meat eaters, and it shows that in the millennium, now just follow my thinking, you don't have to believe this, this is just thinking. There are a lot of meat eaters at that time that were just rapaciously killing other dinosaurs and feeding on their flesh. And what does God say is going to take place in the millennium, the 11th chapter of Isaiah, that even lions and tigers will be herbivores, they will not any longer be predators and meat eaters, 
and it shows that even snakes will not be poisonous, that a child could play right there where a poisonous snake is denned up and not suffer any harm. Therefore, God's way is not for one creature to kill another creature according to what it says. Now, don't worry about eating meat. I'm not getting off into vegetarianism here because that's a different subject when you come to the clean animals that God has intended for human consumption. But it's interesting and it made me wonder if God, it's almost like you could portray it that God goes off somewhere and He's gone a couple of million years, okay? And then He comes back to find out how Lucifer's been doing with his job. And he looks and he sees all this going on. These hideous, ugly creatures killing one another and so on. And he decides, this is bad. This is not good at all. Well, whatever did occur, there was a time when this earth was just teeming with a different kind of life that was not necessarily compatible with man. And it was all destroyed and buried under thousands of feet, sometimes 20,000 feet of solid rock. And it is down there, and you know it, and I know it. It's not a theological statement. It's a geological statement. And where we get our fossil fuels is out of the buried civilization, if you want to call it that, the buried life, fossil life now, but buried life that once exist, existed on this earth. So God prepared this earth for man. Now back in the first chapter, I won't turn back to that, I won't read all of it either. He said, let there be light. So he just rolled the clouds back. He said, let the dry land appear. And so the tectonic plates began to groan and shudder and the water began cascading off. And if you want to take a pan, dirty up your bathroom or just do it outside in a great big pan sometime, take a flat cake pan, smear it with mud and put a bunch of rocks and things in it, all kinds of dirt and twigs and rock and just slowly lower it in a great big bucket of some kind, and then just raise it up all of a sudden and just tilt it slightly. And when you're through, take a look at what happens, what the water running off did to all the mud that you put there, and you will have in miniature a picture of the topography of the earth. If you look at Grand Canyon, you look at some of the areas that have been scoured by water, you see what I'm talking about. There was then a time when the world was completely covered. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God said, let the dry land appear. And they began to expand. And you all know that it is floating on magma. And you know that the tectonic plates are moving. You've studied earthquake faults, so you know that's true. And you know how Africa, the bulge of it, and South America seem to fit together like a puzzle and that there is adequate information to say that perhaps that was all expanded and some of those cracks in the tectonic plates in the bed of the Atlantic seem to bear that out. So having said that, there was a time when the earth was created. There was a time when it became completely corrupt and a great war took place that resulted in its destruction. Now there is coming a time when God is going to restore all things, the Bible says that Jesus has been assumed up into the heavens until the time of the restitution of all things. So the Bible has a beginning and it has an ending. And at the time of the ending of the Word of God, we can go clear back to the book of Revelation and take a look at what it says. Let's go to the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation. The whole story of what God is doing here below has been so twisted out of all recognizable form that almost no one understands it. If I say, in a nutshell, the plan of God is this, let us make man in our image, most people won't get it because God is recreating after His own kind. God is recreating after the God kind. He's not interested in little puppies. He's not interested in old bloodhounds. He's not interested in lower level beings. He could have created you and you could be an automaton, wag your tail whenever the tread of the master comes in upon the hearth. He didn't want that. He wants those who are members of his family who are on a level with Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who is called the firstborn among many brethren, why does he want them? Why does he need more? I don't even want to intrude into that. Because there are questions beyond the next phase of creation that are almost too awesome to contemplate. But for some reason, God needs more. Otherwise, he wouldn't even be messing with us human beings. 
He wouldn't have created Adam and Eve. He wouldn't have saved mankind because of Noah's righteousness. He would have been through them all, forget it, do something else. But Noah found grace with God and was the only righteous man of his generation. One man. And because he was righteous, his family was saved. Look at the 19th chapter of Revelation. I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse, verse 11. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. Now there is a countdown going on in heaven right now. Invasion is being prepared. You and I are like the French underground, knowing, and knowing that we know, that we're in trouble. That there is war out here. That there are hideous horrible violations of persons' civil rights and human rights. People are being carted away to concentration camps as they were then. But today, little children are being exploited, sometimes even by churchmen. Today, UNICEF, the United Nations, is putting out a book encouraging little children to engage in sex. Today, there's a gay rights movement. Today, there are all these horrifying things, wars here and there, bigger wars about to happen, the threat of the United States against Iraq, the threat of the Saudis and other people to clamp down an oil embargo, the threat of a global economic meltdown, the threat of AIDS, the threat of every kind of other communicable disease, the threat of the spread of anthrax or attacks by chemical, biological, or nuclear weapons, the threat of rogue nations getting a hold of dirty bombs and exploding them in a sports arena in the United States. That's not a theological statement any more than Matthew 24 was a theological book or a theological chapter of a book. What is theological about a war? You shall hear wars and rumors of wars. What's that? Something that you talk about in liturgy? Droughts, famines, disease epidemics? And except those days should be cut short, there would no flesh remain alive on the face of the earth. And what do you hear almost every day? I just looked at a book and discarded it the other day. I was going to pick up a book and read it. It is about some one runaway Russian. Some guy fantasizes that he has got now these virulent poisons and the man, the hero, has got to prevent him from doing it or he would exterminate all life on the earth. It used to be, you know, that you prevented a bank robbery. Now, some of the thrillers, the page turners, the mystery type of adventure type thing, it's always all of mankind is at stake, or at least a whole nation, or the assassination of a president, or something like that. But it's not a theological statement to say that the world is in horrible trouble, is it? And that something desperately needs to be done to bring the world peace, and we know that this world is not going to have peace in the way that men are pursuing it. He that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness, in perfect judgment, he doth judge and do something that no Protestant in this world and no Catholic wants to even remotely contemplate, and there it is in the Word of God in the closing chapters of the Bible. He's going to make war. There are a lot of people who need to have war come down on their heads. Saddam Hussein, a whole lot of people. People in Georgia, people in Russia, people in Japan and China, people in North Korea, people in Libya, and a lot of people here in the United States too, truth be told. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. This is, of course, metaphor because of the many titles that he wears. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And people that want to get into the sacred names business better think about that because they're just barking up the wrong tree. If, if Hebrew were the way to get in touch with God, then the average taxi driver in Tel Aviv is a whole lot closer to God than Billy Graham. All right? And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood to remind people of the fact that he was murdered. And his name is called the Word of God. Look at the first chapter of John. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean, depicting the righteousness of their purpose the absolute impeccable judgment and per perfect righteousness of their cause. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that's his divine command by fiat, by which he can make anything happen that he wishes, that with it he should smite the nations. How is he going to do that? There is one scripture in the Bible in the Minor Prophets that says, those who fight against Jesus Christ at his coming, it says their flesh will just melt off their bones and his eyes will melt in their sockets and a clatter of white bones will fall down in a little pile and the flesh is all gone. 
Now that sounds like the effects of an atomic bomb, doesn't it? Like the lady whose print dress was indelibly printed on the stone bridge in Hiroshima and the lady herself was absolutely vaporized. And that white flash that took place overhead that wiped out over 90 some thousand people in a matter of moments kind of took the picture of the lady's print dress and printed it indelibly on stone and the woman herself was vaporized. Can you be vaporized? You bet. The pieces of those poor people that slammed in those 767s into the trade tower, some of them are smaller than your little fingernail. They were absolutely dissolved. Sure, we human beings can have that happen to us. And that's what God is going to do to those who would dare fight Him at His coming. Now there are people that fight Him intellectually today. There are people that fight Him spiritually. They fight Him with every kind of an excuse. They fight Him by turning their back on Jesus Christ and by just reveling in the sins of this world. They fight Him by rejecting Him. They fight Him by saying the law has been done away. But then they're going to try to fight Him, literally, and they're going to be shooting their rockets and their rifles and everything else up toward the invading Christ. Christ is going to invade this earth. The armies followed Him, and out of His mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it He should smite the nations, and He shall rule them with a rod of iron. Now my dad used a ping pong paddle on me when I was a boy, but he never did whack me on the shins with a, with a little curtain rod. Now that would have really got my attention. The ping pong paddle got my attention, I'll tell you what, it was fine. About a hundred of those, you're willing to do anything. And, uh, but there are some people that, that need this that I can point out to you, and it's going to happen. This is the best news that the world could ever hear, but it rejects it. The world doesn't like what I'm reading to you right here. They won't read this every Sunday. Righteousness, make war, what? Jesus Christ, make war, kill people, what? You think you're going to go to the Methodist church and hear that? No, you won't. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Are there sins that you absolutely hate? Are there things that you read of and hear about on television? What about a lecherous old curmudgeon that has been hidden behind the garments that are priesthood, who has been moved from one place to another, to another, to another, which is nothing more than a fresh opportunity to just destroy the lives of young boys. And then his own superiors cover up for it. What, what, do you, what, what do you think about that? What do you think about children five and six and seven being taught about homosexuality? What do you think about the people who are the purveyors of that kind of smut? What should be done to the people who perpetrate it, who publish it, and pass the laws to get it distributed among our children and grandchildren? Is God angry with these people? Or does God, is God tolerant? I preached a sermon one time. Is God tolerant? Well, everybody's got to be tolerant today. Got to be tolerant of other people's religion. God is intolerant as He can be. He will not compromise with His law one inch. God is intolerant of that, but He's just patient. The time is going to come when He will intervene. He hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to the fowls that fly, eagles, vultures, ravens, magpies, different kinds of birds that feed on carrion. Come and gather yourselves unto the supper of the great God. Then God's supper is a macabre, grotesque supper. You cannot imagine a battlefield with 16 million bodies lying there, and you can't imagine clouds of vultures so thick that they nearly blacken the sun, flying with croaks and regurgitating part of what they can't get airborne in their stomachs. But that's what this is depicting to you. The time when God is going to pour out His wrath upon this earth he said that you may eat the flesh of kings. Oh, then kings won't be buried with great pomp and circumstance. They won't lie there with a million people coming by and crying and weeping and adoring them even in death. They won't be buried in great huge pyramids. They won't be in gigantic sarcophagy. They won't have a big marble slab in the floor of a great basilica or a great abbey somewhere. Uh, they won't have any monument, them standing on a horse. Uh, all pigeon splattered as probably it should be, but uh, in, in the public park. They won't have that done to them. 
that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, free and bond, small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him. It sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he had deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, which is a voluntary reception, not an involuntary one that is imposed upon you. It's not some strong arm person that holds you down, transplant, uh, puts a, a chip uh, inside the skin of your forehead. And then that worshiped his image, that's voluntary worship. These were both cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. What's the most horrifying death you and I can imagine? Worse than drowning, burning to death. And who's going to do this? Jesus Christ. Who's he going to do it to? The beast and the false prophet, the head of an evil, twisted, perverted, rotten, filthy church. And the military dictator of ten nations with whom he is in direct collusion. And Christ is going to drag them by the nape of their neck and throw them kicking and screaming over there as the very first punitive act in person, up close, that he accomplishes after he stands upon this earth. Now, it says the remnant were slain and the fowls were filled with their flesh. Go on to the 21st chapter for a moment. He says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Oh, a lot of people don't focus in on that. They miss the bulk of what that says and they focus on one little tiny grain of sand in an endless seashore of trillions upon trillions upon trillions and focus on one called Eretz or the earth. But he says, I saw a new heaven, a new heaven and a new earth. So apparently there is coming even a new universe, a new heaven and maybe the things that are in it. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. It doesn't need to be a sea because there don't need to be weather patterns because there are no oxygen breathing creatures on this earth anymore. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he, God, will dwell with them. Oh, then we're not going up there to dwell with him, but he is coming down here to dwell with us. And they shall be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. I've got to perform a funeral day after tomorrow. And I'll guarantee you there's going to be sorrow and crying. There always is at a funeral. Won't happen anymore. No more death. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Now it says the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and that God the Father is coming down to this earth. I ask at the beginning, do you believe in life in outer space? Well, I do, because I know that God is in his heaven, and all is well in heaven today. And everything is going according to plan, and nothing happens that is not allowed of God, even though it is not always His will. I dealt with that when 9-11 occurred. What allows, what, what happens, what He allows on this earth is not what God always wills. But nothing happens contrary to His will if He decides He doesn't want it done. And like those thousands of people, many of whom in little cells, of underground sat listening for just that one French phrase where they knew that tomorrow morning invasion, invasion is going to happen and we're going to be liberated. So there is a countdown from heaven where Jesus Christ is coming back to liberate this world, liberate the women of Afghanistan, liberate the women and children of Iraq, liberate the people of North Korea, liberate all the Chinese, liberate people, whoever they are, including, yes, even those in the prisons, if they will repent and just cry buckets of tears and beg God's forgiveness, and God will say, I forgive you, go and sin no more. Christ is coming to liberate the world 
but he's got to conquer it first, just like we had to conquer Europe before we could liberate the French, the Belgians, the Dutch, the Poles, and so many other races that had been under the heel of a brutal dictator for many years and millions of them died. So that's why I say that I believe in life in outer space.